Dripping down science. The Naked Scientists. Hello, it's Sunday the 7th of August. Welcome to The Naked Scientist. I'm Chris Smith and also here this week are physicist Dave Ansell. Hello, Dave. Hi there. And also from our Naked Astronomy Space Science podcast, Dominic Ford. Hello, Dominic. Hello, Chris. Now, together, we're all taking on your science questions this week, including finding out, do bubbles help or hinder when doing the washing up? Does Earth's rotation affect or alter the duration of an aeroplane flight? And is the fluoride that's in drinking water actually dangerous. Dominic. Plus, we've got news this week that the Earth once had more than one moon and how vampire bats home in on the jugular. Scientists have discovered that that they've got infrared sensors to help them locate warm blood vessels. And I've got a soapy experiment for you to try. You just need a bowl and some washing up liquid or even better, some liquid hand soap. We'll tell you what to do with it, apart from wash your hands, very shortly. If you'd like to get in touch with us here at The Naked Scientist, and we do love to hear from you... You can tweet at Naked Scientists, write on our Facebook page, that's at thenakedscientist.com slash Facebook, or drop us an email. Our email address is chris at thenakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.co.uk. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith, with Dave Ansell and with Dominic Ford. And we're kicking off, as we always do, with a look at some of this week's top science stories and off into outer space to start with Dominic. That's right. A paper published in this week's issue of the journal Nature presents evidence that the Earth might once have had a second moon. Now, this stems from a puzzling problem with the geology of the moon's surface. Now, if you look at the moon, even just with the naked eye, what you see is that the moon's surface is differentiated into light patches and dark patches. Um, And the dark patches are flatter volcanic plains that we call seas, and the lighter patches are rougher, more mountainous regions. And this this gives us the man in the moon? That's right. The the shape of that pattern is the man in the moon. But what's rather surprising is that the seas are clustered together and the mountains are clustered together. Now, in in most formation models of the Moon, you'd expect them to be randomly distributed over the surface. And it it seems to be beyond chance that these seas have all formed on one side of the Moon. So what uh, Martin Jutzi at the University of California and his colleagues have done is to completely reconsider the formation model of how the Moon came to be. Now, the traditional model is that about four and a half billion years ago, a planet about the size of Mars that people call Thea collided with the proto-Earth, totally melted the proto-Earth, and so you had this ball of molten magma out of which some globule will have split off and ended up in orbit about the Earth, and that became our Moon. And that would also explain why the Moon that the Earth has is so big relative to the Earth compared with other planets with much smaller moons that we see in the solar system. That's absolutely right. The Moon is the biggest uh, moon in the solar system of any planet. Now, what Jutsi thinks may have happened is that, in fact, two moons formed out of that collision. So you had two moons in orbit around the Earth, and that would be stable for about 100 million years. You could have two moons orbiting about the Earth. Both on the same sort of orbit, Uh, at the same distance away? They would be orbiting at about the same radius out from the Earth, but about 60 degrees apart in the sky. But after about 100 million years, those would gradually drift together and eventually collide. And he's wondering, could that collision lead to one side of the moon looking different from the other? Would that be a fairly catastrophic collision, like we were talking about in the first place, or would they slowly catch up and just fairly slowly merge together? They would slowly merge together, and that's actually quite important for the model. Um, Jutsi uh, sums up a potential problem with this theory quite well in his paper. He says, collisions tend to make holes in things. They tend to make craters and basins. They don't tend to make mountains. So how could you make a collision between two bodies make mountains? And he argues that if the collision is slow enough, you don't have enough energy there to melt lots of rock and to dig, dig out craters. And so what you basically get is a pile of rubble on one side of the moon, a very large pile of rubble that forms mountains. And that's why all of the mountains on the moon are on one side. And additionally, in his computational models that he's run of these simulations, 
it turns out that the magma inside the centre of the moon is pushed out to the other side of the moon by the force of the impact. And, and that leads to increased volcanism. That leads to the volcanic plains that we see on the near side of the moon, the Sea of Tranquility and so forth. So is the fact that the um, the seas are all pointing towards the Earth and the mountains are mostly on what we call the dark side of the moon, is that just fluke or is it something to do with the mass distribution thing? Uh, it's essentially just fluke because um, it would be fairly random which side of the moon the, the eventual collision would be on. Dominic, thank you, and fascinating as well because obviously the, the moon is a very iconic thing. We all look at it and people often wonder, well, where does it come from? And the fact there could have once been two of them, even more interesting. I'm just going to drop this one into the equation because I saw this this week and I thought that is hilarious. This is from the Daily Telegraph this week and it says, Swedish man arrested after trying to split atoms in kitchen. A Swedish man has been arrested after attempting to split atoms in his kitchen, claiming that he was only doing it as a hobby. In inverted commas, Richard Handel said that he had the radioactive elements radium, americium and uranium in his apartment in southern Sweden when police showed up and arrested him on charges of unauthorised possession of nuclear material. Handel, 31, said he tried for months to set up a nuclear reactor at home and he kept a blog about his experiments, including describing how he created a small meltdown on his stove. It was only later that he realised it might not actually be legal and he sent a question to Sweden's radiation authority, querying the fact, and they answered promptly by sending the police. I've always been interested in physics and chemistry, Handel said, adding that he just wanted to see if it's possible to split atoms at home. Um, the police raid took place in late July. The police haven't commented. Um, Handel could face fines or up to two years in prison. Um, he, it says, although he says the police didn't detect dangerous levels of radiation in his apartment, he now acknowledges the project wasn't such a good idea. From now on, I will stick just to the theory, he said. I think that's absolutely delightful. <laughs> That is absolutely brilliant, although he's not the first person to try this. There was an American school kid who managed it a few years back. Now, back onto the um, astronomical theme. Um, NASA's most recent mission to Jupiter, which is called Juno, was launched this week, and it's actually got a crew of three. The three aren't, however, normal astronauts, because that's kind of expensive. They're actually three Lego figures attached to the outside of the spacecraft. Outside? The, the outside. Gosh. <laughs> Sounds a fairly harsh environment. It's, yeah, indeed. The figures are representations of the Roman god Jupiter, his wife Juno, and Galileo, um, who was the first person to discover the moons of Jupiter. Um, and for that matter, any moons around any planet other than Earth. Um, Juno, Juno is going to Jupiter as um, it's the largest planet in the solar system and contains more mass than all the other planets combined. And so it probably started forming before the other planets, so it may tell us about the early evolution of the solar system. Juno is going to study the atmosphere and the magnetosphere of the Jupiter to try and discover more about its composition and its structure. The figures should be going on a very long journey, about 2.8 billion kilometres. First on an orbit which sends them out just outside um, the orbit of Mars and getting an additional kick from the Earth's gravity in 2013, and arriving in Jupiter in 2016 when Juno can start its mission. Unfortunately for any Jovian children out, out there who may come across these Lego men, they're actually made out of solid chunks of aluminium, and therefore they're not articulated, so playing them could be rather what, dull. Why aluminium? Why not traditional plastic with yellow face? I think what's probably going on is that a lot of plastics uh, do what called outgassing. They kind of you get, get sort of substances which evaporate out of them, and they can recondense on things like lenses and really sensitive bits of equipment. So probably someone in NASA is going, uh, "You're not using proper Lego, so you're going to have to make them out of aluminium instead." Is this just a cynical publicity stunt? Are they just trying to appeal to young people, kids, and, and get people like us talking about it? I mean, I think it's a publicity stunt, certainly, um, the, and they are attempting to, but I think less, not quite entirely cynical. They're basically trying to get kids interested in. In space science and general science and engineering so they've got a big project involving lego um in order to just get people interested in science engineering and space because jupiter is absolutely huge i heard the stat maybe you could fit say a thousand earths inside jupiter it's certainly got a storm on it which is the size of the whole planet earth just in one tiny corner of jupiter that's right it's the largest planet in the solar system weighing several hundred times the mass of the earth and measuring 10 times the radius of the earth across so, for example, there's a hurricane on Jupiter, the Great Red Spot, which measures the size of the Earth across, and that's been blowing for several hundred years. And, in fact, it's because of the weather systems on Jupiter that it's really such a fascinating planet to study. Jupiter rotates on its axis every 10 hours, despite being a huge planet, so that's at tremendous speed. So a day on Jupiter is actually 10 hours, not 24. That's right. It's less than half the length of a day on the Earth. Now, given how big Jupiter is... That's spinning at phenomenal speed, 
and that drives tremendously strong wind systems that creates the banding of troops that we see and these hurricanes like the Great Red Spot. And it's really fascinating to try and understand those more. Indeed. OK, thanks, Dominic. Now, how do bloodthirsty vampire bats home in on the best place to bite and therefore guarantee achieving a trouble-free feed? Well, the answer is that they've evolved their own built-in infrared detectors to pinpoint where the best blood vessels are. And David Julius from the University of California, San Francisco, is behind the discovery. Hello, David. Hello. What made you think that bats might actually be resorting to temperature to guide them to where they should sink their teeth in this way? So it's been known for uh, for you know, several decades that bats have these so-called pit organs on their face that uh, are heavily innervated with nerve fibers that allow them to detect infrared radiation. What we've done is to ask what the molecular underpinnings of that system might be. So how these special pit structures on their faces can actually pick up infrared or heat? That's right. And how did you approach it? What did you do? We're sort of more generally interested in the, in the whole mechanism of temperature sensation, uh, how we as humans, for example, detect things like hot and cold. Uh, and, and we've been interested in, in finding out how this works in animals that um, really sort of take thermal sensation to the extreme in a way and use this in a different but generally related manner. And what we did was to use some new methods in genomics, what they call deep sequencing or DNA sequencing, where we can really profile uh, all the genes that are expressed in different tissues. And we ask what kind of molecules are expressed uh, in, the, uh, in the nerve cells that send their projections to these heat sensing pits and are known to be involved in the infrared detection mechanism. And then we look through those to find molecules that might be involved in this form of what turns out to really be uh, heat sensation. Okay, so we know that our skin is sensitive to heat and we have a pretty good idea how it detects heat. There are various chemicals which are on the surface of nerve cells that sensitise those nerve cells when the temperature goes up. So are you saying that a variant of one of those is being used by the bats on their face in order to not just detect temperature but to specifically detect temperature relevant to body heat? Yes, that's exactly the case. So what we've shown is that the bat expresses a form of a protein that we also use to detect heat but the form of the protein that the bat expresses is in some ways optimized where the, the temperature required for activation is lower than it is for our heat sensors and enables them to detect body heat coming from their prey, from a blood supply, from a cow or a pig, what have you. So the basic underlying mechanism is the same as the one we use, but they have some little bit of genetic trickery that enables them to modify the protein so that it's more sensitive to heat and can pick up radiant heat from their blood supply. So they're using the same genetic machinery that they would use elsewhere in the body to pick up when they're being burned or things are getting too hot. But in these special facial regions, they are tweaking the gene a bit so that it becomes more sensitive at a lower temperature so they can use those organs to see where there is heat radiating from the right bit of an animal they want to bite so they can infer where the blood vessels must be. Right, exactly. In the body of a mammal, the sensory nerve fibres, for example, that... Uh that allow you to sense temperature or touch or pain uh, are distributed into different what we call ganglia that contain clusters of nerve cells. And those that innervate everything from the neck down are in one set of ganglia, and those that innervate everything from the neck up are in another set. And in our bodies, those two sets of neurons are more or less the same. There are some slight differences in the expression of genes, but pretty much what you see in one cluster of neurons is the same as in the others. And in the vampire bat, what we found is that in this particular gene that expresses this heat sensor, the nerve clusters that send nerve fibers to everything from the neck up to the facial area, which includes these heat sensing pits, the expression of this one heat sensor is different. The protein coming from that gene is modified so that it takes on this different form. And in fact, that's one of the uh, big clues that tells us that this gene is likely involved in this specialized function of the vampire bat, namely infrared sensation, because it is modified, and it's modified only in those clusters of nerve cells that send uh, their nerve fibers to this region of the body that is involved in infrared detection. There are other animals that also home in on heat. There are some snakes and vipers, for example, that aim for the hot spot because that's where they want to envenomate because they, I guess, figure that if they put the venom where the heat is, that's where the blood is, so it will act most quickly and they'll also guarantee a strike on the animal. Do they use the same mechanism as your bats then? Um, they use a mechanism that's, um, that's related but in detail different. 
One of the uh, great examples of this in terms of tick fibers is, is a snake that lives out in, uh, around my area here called the Western Diamondback Rattlesnake. And it also has what we call facial pits. They're somewhat different structure than the vampire bat, but generally the similar plan. And they detect, you know, radiant heat, say, from a squirrel or a mouse that they're trying to find in a dark burrow at night. So it allows them to see the animal as, as a radiant, illuminated figure. And they use a protein molecule that detects temperature that's a member of the same protein or gene family as the one found in the vampire bat and the one that we use for heat detection. It's encoded by a different gene, but they're part of the same gene family. And so overall, the mechanism is similar, but the exact molecule that's used is different in its detail and in its structure. And just to finish up, David, given that you've got this new insight into how this gene can change its behaviour if you do what the vampire bats are doing to it, in other words, make it sensitive at a lower temperature, how does this inform our understanding of how pain is signalled in the nervous system and could there therefore be some uses of what you've discovered? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And the the molecule that we express, which, by the way, I should say is the is the target for pungent agents from things like chili peppers. So the molecule that, uh, that we're talking about here that's involved in temperature sensation in the bat and in our own nervous system is what allows us to appreciate sort of that hot zing from chili peppers. Um, we're interested in that molecule, as are many other labs, because there's evidence to suggest that it is also modified by agents that are produced during inflammation and tissue injury that then sensitize the whole system so that you now, for example, would uh, appreciate a lower temperature as being something painful. So the example would be if you have a sunburn and then you get in the shower and the temperature is normally what you consider to be warm and very comfortable, you might consider that or, or perceive that as being noxiously or painfully hot. And that has to do with the fact that these inflammatory agents are acting on this molecule to lower its threshold to heat and therefore generate a perception of pain even in temperatures that normally you wouldn't consider painful. And understanding how that occurs and how changes in this molecule and how the structure of this molecule is involved in those sensitization mechanisms is very important for understanding pain hypersensitivity, especially in the context of tissue injury. And looking at the structure of these special bat receptors gives us some clues about what parts of the molecule might be involved in those kinds of temperature shifts. Who would have thought it? We know that garlic drives vampires away, but now maybe that chilli attracts them. David, thank you very much. This is David Julius. He's from UCSF, and you can find the work that he was talking about published this week. It's in the journal Nature. Thank you, David. Now, another big breakthrough this week is uh, a piece of research that's come out of Columbia University. It's been published in the journal Cell, and it's by Asa Abelievich. And what he and his colleagues have been able to do is to take skin cells, so-called fibroblasts, and convert them directly into brain cells by injecting a modified virus, which brings into the cells three special genes, which are what are called transcriptional regulators. These are genes which control the behaviour of other genes, and they're normally active in the front part of the brain. So what they've been able to do is to persuade skin cells 68% of the time after this virus is introduced to them to turn into, in a dish as they watch, mature adult nerve cells. They look like nerve cells, they behave like nerve cells, firing off nerve impulses, they behave and respond to drugs in the same way that nerve cells would, And even if they take these cells they've made and they inject them into the brains of developing mice, after the animals are born, you can take a section through the brain and you can see these human, uh, because they've used human skin as the origin for this, you can see these human neurons embedded in the brains of these mice, actually wired in and functional. Now, why is this important? Well, for a start, it means that you can make new nerve cells without having to first turn the cells into stem cells, which we know is involved uh, or can be used, but we know is involved in making mutations or genetic changes to the cells. So it's beneficial from that point of view. But the real piece de resistance is that they also did the study using skin cells from patients who had Alzheimer's disease. And what they ended up with were neurons that behaved biochemically, showing exactly the same biochemical abnormalities that you see in nerve cells from people who have Alzheimer's disease. And so this is a way of making a very faithful model in a dish of cells which behave biochemically just like the cells that a person suffering from a disease, in this case Alzheimer's disease, actually has, and therefore it gives you the opportunity to test new treatments or new drugs or experiment in other various ways on a very faithful reproduction of what that person's got wrong with them without actually having to try it on the person 
or without actually having to do experiments uh, on cells that may, in their own way, be an unreliable model to use. Does that mean that if skin cells effectively have the same problem as the brain cells in Alzheimer's disease, then Alzheimer's disease is actually a whole body problem rather than just a brain problem? Well, not necessarily, because remember that the genome that you have is present in every cell in the body. Uh, You're using that giant recipe book to do everything. So when you turn these skin cells into brain cells, they start turning on all the genes that brain cells would. And so when the cells are in the brain, they produce too much of this protein, beta amyloid, or they process the beta amyloid wrongly. They chop it up in the wrong way. So instead of degrading it into something harmless, it produces a chemical which starts to accumulate and build up into aggregates in the brain. And for that reason, um, it's very hard to study this except in animal models because you want to make an animal that has Alzheimer's disease but animals don't naturally have Alzheimer's disease so any model you make is an unreliable indicator and also if you try doing it with stem cells you introduce genetic changes into the cells and then you don't know if you're studying the real disease or some kind of problem that you've made in making the cells this seems to avoid those problems because it's a much gentler process so I think it's therefore a very very encouraging breakthrough. That's it for this week's news. You can follow up on any of those stories if you'd like to. They're all on our website at nakedscientist.com forward slash news if you'd like to read a transcript of those stories or if you would like to see the references for them. Laying the facts bare. The Naked Scientists. And you're listening to The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith with Dave Ansell and Dominic Ford. In a moment, we're off to the beach to discover how riptides can pull surfers out to sea. But first, we're getting stuck into some of your questions this week. And joining us to talk, first of all, let's talk to Martin, who wants to talk about about lenses. Hello, Martin. Hi, how are you doing? I'm all right, thank you. Uh, I think this is probably one for Dave. So, Dave, over to you and Martin. Hi, Dave. Hi. Yeah, I, I just wondered if I was uh, stranded somewhere and I wanted to start a fire using uh, camera lenses, would I be best to use a telephoto or a wide-angle lens, assuming they had the same aperture? I think the biggest effect is essentially just the aperture of the lens and how big the lens is to start with, because it's basically how much light you can focus in onto your on, into that spot of the sun. So you want essentially something which will work in the dark as much as possible, so as lower f-stop as possible. So probably an f, the wide-angle lens will work better and get more heat in that small space and cause ignition. But the total amount of energy you can get in is limited by the radius of your lens, so the big lens you use is better. The biggest effect, I would say, is you want to use a cheap lens because the focal length of all these lenses are to focus onto a sheet of film at the back of your camera, and that's probably only two or three centimetres away from the back of the lens. And so you're going to, any fire you start is going to be very, very close to your lovely camera lens, so use as cheap a one as possible. Martin, let me uh, let you in on a little secret. Um, about three years ago, we went punting down the River Cam for The Naked Scientist, and we actually recorded a programme from the River Cam. And we invited Dave along to do a kitchen science experiment. And Dave said, well, I thought I'd show you how you can set fire to things with a lens. And we thought he was going to produce a little magnifying glass or something and burn a little spot in, in a piece of paper or something. He produced a baking tray, rolled up a whole bunch of newspaper on it, and then out of his rucksack pulled the lens out of an overhead projector, and I mean the really big lens, that was about a foot across. And when he focused this thing, it produced... It looked like a laser beam. And honestly, there was an inferno in our, in our wooden boat. Wooden boat, Dave, within about... I think 30 seconds you had a, a fire raging so it was it was very effective as a fire raising yeah I mean, the most important thing is to get the most energy into a small space as possible so the larger the diameter of that lens the better so there is Martin if you want to follow it up there is a picture of Dave doing that on our website I think if you go to nakedscientist.com slash kitchen science there, there are pictures there so I hope that helps you in, in your in your attempt at bushcraft I'll do my best <laughs> all right thanks for joining us thanks bye see you later Matt Lewis is with us hello Matt Hi. Go for it. I think this is a Dominic sort of directed question, isn't it? Okay. So my question is a really quite a simple one. Um, I understand that in some of the larger historical meteorite strikes on Earth, that they were sufficiently energetic that some matter achieved escape velocity. And if that's true, did the moon capture any of this matter? And is there any detectable evidence of these impacts on the moon? Yes, you're absolutely right that most impacts of bodies onto a planet will give a lot of material escape velocity and that material will be lost as debris to space. And so there's a lot of debris out there in the solar system, and the chances are that it will 
within a few million years collide with one of the planets. Now, if you've got uh, bodies colliding with the Earth, then statistically that material is quite likely to end up on the Moon simply because the Moon is the closest body to us. It's only 400,000 kilometres away, about 100 times closer than the next nearest object, which would be Mars. The problem would be actually identifying individual features on the Moon as being from meteor impact from material coming from the Earth. If you just look at a crater, all you can say is that material of such and such a mass has impacted the Moon. You have to actually find the meteorite and recover it to start doing chemical analysis on that to try and work out where it's come from. For example, if you can find trapped gases in there, you can try and match it against the atmosphere of one of the planets. Um, now, the Moon has no atmosphere, and that means these meteorites will get quite a hard impact onto the surface, and they will probably be totally vaporised in the impact, unlike, for example, meteor impact on the Earth or Mars, which are cushioned by the atmosphere, and so those, those objects can survive and be found. Also, of course, we haven't explored very much of the Moon's surface in comparison to Mars, where we've had rovers roving the surface for the last six years or so, finding certainly dozens of meteorites on the surface of Mars. So we haven't really explored enough to find meteorites on the Moon, even if they were there, though I think you'd be lucky to find them. I think that's probably a pretty good synopsis. Would you agree, Matt? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. OK, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Dominic. Susie is on the line. Hello, Susie. Hello. Well, I have a rhubarb plant that's descended from my great-grandfather's garden. He originally had the plant, split it and gave some to my grandfather, who in turn did the same for my father, and my father repeated this, resulting in the plant that I now have in the garden. So my question is, does my fourth-generation plant share the identical DNA profile of my great-grandfather's rhubarb, or will the plants have evolved to create their own unique DNA? Wow, so you have this rhubarb that you can trace mm. all that way back. Isn't that amazing? Well, the answer is that plants obviously use DNA the same way that we do. Uh, their cells contain a copy of their genome, and that genome gets translated into the proteins that make all of the enzymes that make the biochemistry that keeps the plant alive and also that creates its cells and so on, just like we do. But plants have a slightly lower metabolism than we do, so their DNA tends to accrue damage more slowly than ours does, so they don't tend to accrue mutations quite as quickly as we might, but that doesn't mean that they don't necessarily accrue mutations. So when you're splitting your rhubarb, you're effectively cloning it because you're splitting an organism down the middle and the beautiful thing about plants is that if you split them in two like that you just get two offspring that are genetically identical because they came from one plant originally and if you then grow those up they'll make a new plant and if you split that again you'll get another clone of that plant and those clones are genetically identical but there can be bits of those clones which can have DNA changes in them and a really good way of seeing this I don't know if you've ever seen a variegated plant have you seen plants that have say a white outer edge to a green leaf if you watch, yeah. if you look at plants like that, sometimes you'll find a stem coming off of it where it seems to have lost the variegation. You'll see that the leaves are completely green. Uh, they've lost their white edging. Have you ever seen that? Yes, yeah. What's actually happened there is that the genetic change which gave the plant its variegation, that white profile around the edge of the leaf, whatever that gene is, or little cluster of genes that has changed or been mutated, it's reverted, as it's called, back to the original stock, which was the original genetic profile that gave the leaf a complete green outline. There was no white edging to it. And so the plant has, in the bud that gave rise to that stem, produced um, a line which is genetically distinct. And the interesting thing is that that's still connected to a plant which is variegated, but if you took a cutting from that bit of the plant, you would get a, a new genetic stock, if you like, because it's slightly different genetically. Um, so plant Plants do acquire mutations, they do do it from time to time, but if you genetically sequence your rhubarb, it would be nearly identical with a few changes here and there to the one that your grandfather was growing. And the evidence for this is that there are some plants which have propagated clonally like this for generations and generations and generations, and they slowly evolve and adapt to the environment in which they find themselves because there are pressures applied to them from the environment, pests and chemicals and nutrients and so on, but they don't change enormously. Thank you. It's fascinating. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you. And uh, great to have you on the show. You're listening to The Naked Scientists, Chris Smith, Dave Ansell and Dominic Ford. Right, water sports, surfing, bodyboarding, kite surfing and so on, they've all become increasingly popular in recent years. But the number of people who are getting into trouble in the water has correspondingly also gone up. And part of the problem are what are called rip currents. These are 
unexpected and fast-moving currents that can even drag you out to sea, even if you're a very good swimmer. In fact, I had a little brush with one of these when I was in Australia recently. Now, though, a group of surfers and scientists, I suppose you could call them surfer scientists, are trying to understand the processes of these rip currents so that we can make beaches safer places to be. And Planet Earth podcast presenter Sue Nelson has donned her bikini and quite possibly a spotty handkerchief with knots tied in the corner. And she's been to Perrinporth in North Cornwall to meet Dickon Berryman from the RNLI, that's the Royal National Lifeguard Institute, along with Tom, uh, Tim Scott and former European surf champion. Yes, he really is a surf champion, but he's also Professor Paul Russell from the University of Plymouth. It's a three-year project and we're looking at uh, the factors that cause rip currents to vary. The factors are the incoming waves which drive the whole system, measuring the rip currents themselves using the drifters and the the, the shape of the beach, the sandbanks and the, the rip channels in the beach and how those change. The crucial thing about the UK is that we have these large tidal ranges so the water's moving on and off the sandbanks quickly and the waves are changing quickly and therefore rip currents can turn on and off very quickly and this is what causes a major hazard. Now you mentioned the drifters there so this is part of the equipment that you're using to measure this. Tim Scott you were involved in designing this equipment. Take us through the equipment that you're using probably best to start as it's already been mentioned with the drifter. What's a drifter? The drifters themselves stand about uh, a metre tall. The base of them is made up of a a cylinder which is about the size of a two litre drinks bottle Uh, and above that is a mast which extends up to about sort of uh, waist high. The drifters themselves float, they're kind of neutrally buoyant, so when we put them in the surf zone, they, they float with the mast sticking upright and standing up. It's, they have a, a damping plate on the bottom which stops them from surfing on the waves, and they very effectively mimic uh, what, what would happen to a, a person if they were trapped in the surf zone and they were moving around on the rip currents. How many would you use? Well, we use about between 15 and 25. Each drifter itself has got a GPS unit that, is, that tracks its location and it takes a low position every second. We use a couple of interesting survey techniques where we can use a, a GPS base station to make these uh, measurements much more accurate. And these enable us to get very accurate velocities and positions within the surf zone using these bits of equipment. Paul, we've, we've got a, a sort of taste of some of the parameters that are being measured there. What else are these drifters, these GPS tracking devices, actually looking for in the water? Because we continually reseed the drifters, so they, they either get taken out to sea in a rip current or they get washed it back in by the wave. So we're continually reseeding them. So what we're looking for is the changes in the system. So not just measuring it once, but continually changing it as the tide changes, as the waves change and as the seabed topography, the sandbars change and uh, we've just done a six week experiment here which encapsulated quite a range of conditions and we're coming back in October when the beach will be different and the waves will be different and the rip currents will be different and we'll be repeating all the measurements then. Now both um, Tim, yourself and Paul, both keen surfers, have you noticed just purely with your surfing, because there are people here bodyboarding, taking surfboards out, obviously to enjoy the the waves, have you ever noticed yourself that there are certain times of the year or the day when the rip currents seem to be stronger than usual? Yeah, well as a surfer you spend a huge amount of time in the sea and you see rip currents all the time and you know you're constantly in rip currents and moving around in Many surfers might not know exactly the physics behind what's happening, but they're certainly observing them all the time and they have a really good intuitive knowledge of how these rip currents work. And the fact is they do change all the time and from seconds, from groups of waves, all the way through to seasons and annually. You get different kind of rips on different kinds of beaches. So, Dickon, is this what makes them so dangerous as a lifeguard then? as surfers, like Tim have said, that actually they're there all the time and they're really quick? Yeah, potentially. I mean, we've got to remember that it's not not the rip current that kills someone. It's the the inability to cope and potentially the inability to to see it in the first place. So this science backs up what we we think we know already. And that's what's interesting to come out. It it, it gives us a a sort of confidence in in the, the safety messages that we give. 
but also um you know the lifeguards will be will be generally risk assessing all the time dynamically as the tide's dropping out here at Perrinporth it will get worse as, as the as the tide drops and certainly towards low tide is the most dangerous time that we know on this beach and that's built up from experience you know so the guys will now be adjusting how potentially where they put their swimming area they'll be adjusting their advice they give to swimmers and they may possibly even going in the water themselves to, to prevent those those accidents happening. Dickon Berryman from the RNLI with Tim Scott and Paul Russell from the University of Plymouth. They were talking with Sue Nelson. As always, you can find more Planet Earth resources online at thenakedscientist.com slash planet earth. And still to come, we're going to be answering more of your science questions, so now's a very good time to get in touch. You can tweet at Naked Scientists, or you can write on our Facebook page. We've made it very easy to get there, nakedscientists.com slash Facebook, or you can drop us an email. That's to chris at thenakedscientists.com. And on the subject of the beach, we'll be returning to the beach later because in our question of the week this week, we'll be finding out an interesting fact or two about footprints. Now, Dave, this one we mentioned earlier, someone sent in, it was Caroline. She said, do bubbles actually hinder cleaning dishes? People say that bubbles and foam make no difference whatsoever or may even hinder when doing the dishes or your hair or whatever. Are they just effectively there to make us punters think that what we're rubbing into ourselves or rubbing onto our glassware is doing some good? I think yes and no. You tend to get bubbles um, when you're using some kind of detergent, detergent to break down the surface tension of water, which makes it a lot easier for it to dissolve things like fat. Um, little molecules with an oil-loving tail and a water-loving head, so the tail stick into the fat and dissolve it. And they also have the side effect of it means that they can form foams quite easily. Having a very stable foam, though, um, which will sit on the surface of your washing um, bucket will isn't vital for actually doing the cleaning. Um, that's just kind of aesthetic mostly. And if you're in a dishwasher or something, that actually really hinders it. Because or you a get, washing machine. Or washing yeah. machine. Uh, actually, with washing machines, it's quite interesting. In the States, they don't make foam at all because they have um, top-loading washing machines. So you can't see inside. In Europe, we have side-loading washing machines where you can see on the side. They make a bit of foam, but having too much would stop the clothes moving around properly or the jets of water in the dishwasher's um, hitting the dishes and therefore they wouldn't clean as well. But with wa- washing up water i'm not entirely sure it's a bad thing because it like to insulate the water so if you're doing a lot of washing up and you've got a layer of foam on the top it will actually keep it warmer for longer and heat is very very important for cleaning so i think it probably does help but not the way you think it does can you help me out on this one because my mum told me an old wives tale which i think is true which is if you've got biological washing powder which doesn't have an anti-foaming agent it's not automatic washing powder and you need to use it in a machine you can put a cake of soap inside the machine and it stops it frothing up and if indeed you do have bubbles in the bath because I, I used to have a lot of bubble bath when I was a kiddie uh, if you put the soap in the bath the bubbles all break down so what's in the soap that actually doesn't agree with the bubble mixture I'm not entirely sure I'd have thought probably um, you're getting a reaction between the two detergent molecules and you're forming little micelles inside the water which are basically all the tails of one detergent molecule are kind of meeting up with the tails of the other one you form little sort of balls of um, detergents inside the water rather than sitting around on the surface and making foam. Got it. Thank you, Dave. Dominic, uh, Bansi says, does Earth's rotation alter flight times? And I think there are two aspects to this. One is in terms of when, because the Earth is spinning, if you take off in one place and fly in the same or opposite direction to that in which the Earth is turning, what impact does that have on the time it takes you to fly somewhere? And the other is, what about the fact that the aeroplane is moving? Um, Is there a relativity effect because the aeroplane is moving faster than the people who are on the ground? Taking the first part of the question, The atmosphere is obviously moving with the surface of the Earth below it because there's friction between the surface of the Earth and the atmosphere. And so as the atmosphere is moving with the Earth, when you fly up into it, you continue to move with the surface of the Earth. So there's no difference moving with the rotation of the Earth or against it. But the rotation of the Earth does create weather systems, essentially because the equator is moving very fast in order to get around the whole revolution every day whereas areas close to the poles have to move less far. And that difference in speed at different latitudes creates, for example, hurricanes and other weather systems. And that leads to our prevailing wind systems, um, which mean that when you're flying across the Atlantic, for example, it's much faster to go from the US to Britain than to go from Britain to the US. There's also, yeah, the, you get really, really stable high-speed winds high up in the jet stream, which produces huge effect going from the States to here rather than from here to the States. Yes. Going on to relativity, uh, whenever you're moving at high speed, time appears to run slow for you. 
That's called the time dilation principle. And so whichever direction you're moving in this plane, you're moving at high speed, and that will mean that, that time will dilate slightly and you will age slightly less quickly. That won't depend upon where you're going. It will just depend upon the amount of time you spend in the air and how fast you're going. Terrific. Thank you very much. Dominic. Just a bit of feedback. David in Fincham was calling about the question with big lenses and starting fires, your sort of thing, Dave. And he said this actually used to be a very big problem with bullseye glass. Do you remember those glasses you could put into windows and things which had a sort of bullseye pattern in the glass? He said that they would actually act as a magnifying lens and actually start fires in people's homes. Nasty, yeah. It's a I haven't seen them much lately, I have to admit, so maybe, that, maybe they've gone out of fashion for that reason. All the houses with people in them who used to like them have all been burned away. Sort of a survivor <laughs> of the, the fittest house. The time. Yeah. <laughs> I've got another question here for you, Chris, from Eric Turner. He says that his wife has been concerned about fluoride in drinking water. Is there actually any danger to it? Can it do you any harm? It's really interesting, this, the fact that fluoride is almost universally used in in many countries, actually. And it's done because there's this understanding or this chemical reason that fluoride strengthens tooth enamel. Tooth enamel contains the chemical apatite, which is a, a form of calcium phosphate. If you add fluoride to the diet, either in food and salt and drinking water and things, then you can add a fluoride atom to the forming calcium phosphate and you get fluoro appetite and this is much harder than just normal hydroxy appetite the normal stuff tooth is made of so you can actually strengthen your enamel significantly and that's the reason that it's done because it can give people very strong very good quality teeth and if you look at the levels of tooth decay that have happened since this actually was introduced levels of tooth decay have plummeted in many places that fluoridate their water and in fact uh, studies have been done looking at this effect and it seems to suggest that the number needed to treat in other words the number of people who you have to get to drink fluoridated water in order to stop having cavities who otherwise would is about six so for every six people who drink fluoride laden water one person will, will not get cavities who would otherwise have done so that's amazing actually it's a very big health impact but then there's the question are there any health disbenefits and this is where it gets a bit murky, because actually there's very little good quality published evidence one way or the other. There was a very big meta-analysis that was performed by the University of York, which is probably the gold standard, which has been cited by uh, agencies and organisations all over the world since. And what they actually say is um, they have taken 26 plus studies that have looked at fluoride in water and looked at the health benefits, no cavities, and some of the disvent benefits. So for instance, do people who have been drinking fluoridated water have more hip fractures, for example, because if it gets into teeth, it can also get into bones. And if it's in bones, it could potentially alter the strength and the integrity of the bone architecture, so it might make people more prone to fracture. And there's no compelling, convincing evidence that it does associate with more fractures. They've done a similar thing for cancers and not found any association with cancers, but the University of York team say, actually, the level of evidence is quite poor, and really we do need some very big trials and some big studies in order to look at this properly because the evidence is really quite scant. Obviously a lot of people use fluoride toothpaste or fluoride mouthwash, um, what, what additional benefit does the fluoride in the water give? The tooth enamel is in a dynamic equilibrium. So if you have acid in your mouth, then you can erode some of the enamel. If you shift it towards an alkaline environment and there's calcium present and some fluoride, you can rebuild some enamel. So what the toothpaste is aiming to do is to supply you with a, a ready source of alkaline environment, that's why there's bicarbonate in it, and some calcium and some phosphate and they put fluoride in there because then it gets into the matrix that's being laid down as new tooth enamel in this dynamic equilibrium and it strengthens it. If you have too much fluoride though, and this is one of the other things that the York study looked at, you can get something called fluorosis and people who live in Essex especially, I was one of them, if you drink lots and lots of tap water and are exposed to fluoride, there's very high levels of fluoride in the water that you drink and this can get impregnated into the teeth and it's more likely to cause tooth staining and you get this sort of speckledy pattern on the teeth. You'll never get cavities though, they won't look that aesthetic but you never get any tooth decay and I've never had any fillings my entire life. My teeth are really good actually and I put it down to the fact that partly I was from Essex so there are some benefits of being in Essex apart from the fact that it's uh, got some of the best schools in the country. It does have very good water as well and also um, I think cleaning your teeth very regularly with a toothpaste laden with fluoride is really really important so that's very good. Right, some more phone calls. Uh, Malta Olsen is on the line. Hello Malta. Hello. Welcome to the Naked Scientist. What can we do for you? Well, I've got a question about sound and sound loudness and how air pressure makes the sound travel differently. 
for example, loudness of a sound decreases when air pressure decreases. And we know that no sound can travel in a vacuum. However, does this also mean that higher air pressure would result in louder noises? And do deep sea divers in decompression chambers have to keep the voices down because sounds appear louder for them? I don't know about the um, deep sea divers, but what the effect is, is how efficiently you can kind of couple, so get a vibration from the um, musical instrument or your voice into the air, then from the air into your ears. Um, and with all of these transitions, um, you tend to get um, some sound carrying on and some sound reflecting. And the closer the material is, which you're going from and to, the more energy that gets transferred. So if you're going from one bit of air to the other bit of air, pretty much all of the energy is transferred from one to the other. If you're going from air to a solid piece of steel, almost none of the energy is transferred. And actually vice versa, if you're going from a solid bit of steel, almost none of the energy is transferred into air and all of it's reflected. So if you have very, very high pressure, if you increase the pressure of air, it's going to increase its density and make it um, seem to the sound wave more like um, the musical instrument or more like your ear. So more energy will get transferred. So everything will get more efficient. And I would have thought you would hear things louder. Terrific. Dave, thank you very much. In just a second, it's experiment time. But before that, we have a quick question to sneak in from Oliver. Hello, Oliver. Hello. What can we do for you? I was wondering, with wires... How many separate and distinct signals are sent simultaneously along the same line? As with telephone calls or internet calls, you know, along the wires outside? So how do we get so many different signals down the same bit of wire, Dave? Okay, um, there's a variety of different ways of doing this. Some of the older ones um, involve you can basically mix your signal with uh, a radio frequency and essentially send lots of different um, radio frequencies down the same wire, the same piece of copper, um, in the same way as you can send lots of different radio frequencies through space and each one of those can have a different conversation on it and you can send lots of um, phone calls down one piece of copper like that. You can also do something which is called time division multiplexing. So that's whereby you send sort of a hundredth of a second of one person's conversation, a hundredth of a second of another person's conversation, a hundredth of a second of another person's conversation. And you interleave them. And you interleave them, and then you have some electronics which can take those back out again and put it all back together again. Um, Or more recently, um, the last 20 years, you basically digitise everything, and a a phone signal can probably take maybe 10 kilobits of of information. An optic fibre can take um, gigabits of information, so you can get thousands and thousands of phone calls down the same wire. Terrific. Right, better get experimental then. So, Dave and Dominic, what have you got for us? Well, this week's kitchen size is very, very simple. All you need is a carton of, or a sort of container of hand soap. The washing up liquid does work as well, but it, not quite as well. And then a jug or a bowl or something which you can pour it down and pour it down a bit of a slope, which seems to work best. So, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the jug and hold it at a sort of 45-degree angle, a bit like I'm pouring some liquid out of it. It looks a bit like you're going to pour a pint into there, yes, Dave? (laughs) Um, And then I've got um, the container of hand soap. I've taken off the kind of pump off the top, so I've just got the container. And then I'm just going to pour the soap slowly down the side of the jug. So it's trickling down the side of the jug, I can see there, and it's forming... Well, at the Ooh. bottom, but every now and then bits are jumping across the jug, I can see. There's a jet of soap there, which is flying across the jug well, to the other side. Yeah, <laughs> you can clearly see a huge chunk of, uh, or sh- part of the stream just suddenly fl- s- flips out. So You've made a sort of pattern on the bottom of the jug with all your jets uh, are flying across. So, so what's going on, Dave? So it's kind of like the jet is bouncing off the soap which is in there. Now, this is an effect which was only really noticed in the 60s, and the first people tried to explain it was about five years ago, and um, then other people came up with other theories. Surprisingly, they noticed it in the 60s, because I thought characteristically people in the 60s didn't wash very much, and they should be playing around with soap. Rather paradoxical. There's lots of different liquids which you work with. It works for shampoo as well. I've noticed it a few times. So what seems to be going on is that when you pour the soap on, sometimes it kind of drags some air along with it. So you have a kind of tube of soap falling down and then you get a layer of air around the outside which stops the um, soap which is pouring down meeting and joining up with and forming surface tension with the soap which is at the bottom and then it lubricates it really well. And so it will tend to skip, so it could skip across the surface. Then if it hits a bit of a bump, then it will just skip up that bump a bit like it's a ramp and then fly off and bounce. This can actually work with normal fluids, so things like, especially fairly viscous fluids, because that ramp's got to survive for quite a long time. Um, So things like heavy oils, but it's much more difficult to do it like that. 
with things like hand soap, which are what's called sheer thinning, which means if you, it's, it'll sit on your hand in a nice kind of stable blob, but then if you rub it, it gets much, much thinner, and so you can rub it over your hand very easily. So the soap which is sitting there is actually very, very viscous, and it will sit there and it will maintain the ramp for a long time. But soap you're pouring on is kind of being cheered, and therefore it goes very, very thin. Therefore it runs across it very well, and it jumps really high, and you get this rather beautiful effect. And just to finish off, um, where would you see this manifest in the real world? Is, is there actually an, in, a sort of manifestation of this which is important in industry and so on? I mean, this actual effect is mostly a kind of interesting uh, phenomenon, but the uh, lubrication you get with air, people are, are using it to kind of lubricate torpedoes and very high-speed boats. You kind of squirt air under them, reduce the water friction, and they should go faster. Dave, thank you very much. We've actually put a video of that experiment up. It's at nakedscientist.com slash kitchen science. And uh, there are lots of other exciting experiments you can try there, um, including some pictures which were sent in by a friend of our show, which is Randy Heisch, who we're thinking of this week because we heard he's had a bit of bad news. So we hope you're OK, Randy. Right, time to join Diana O'Carroll for this week's Question of the Week. This week, why do some depressions look like expressions? My name is Nikki Goodwin and I live in South Africa. I recently took this photograph of my footprints in the sand, and it was only after that I noted that the footprints are not actually in the sand, they appear to be raised on the sand. How could this be? So what is happening that makes you misinterpret the image? Hello, I'm Rob Jenkins. I'm a cognitive psychologist at the University of Glasgow. The questioner sent in a wonderful photograph of footprints on a sandy beach. What's striking about the photograph is that the footprints seem to rise up from the surface of the sand rather than sinking in. In fact, the footprints are normal footprints. They're sunk in, as you would expect. Their raised appearance is an illusion caused by the pattern of shadows. These shadows are ambiguous. They could result either from bumps lit from the top of the picture plane or from indentations lit from the bottom of the picture plane. In the face of this ambiguity, the brain makes its best guess as to which is more likely, and that is what we see. With this particular image, our brains make the wrong call. Why? Because they have a built-in bias to assume that light comes from above. This is a sensible rule of thumb, because sunlight generally does come from above. But not in this photograph. Here, the sun is setting, behind the photographer, below the bottom of the picture plane. This is evident from clumps of sand in the foreground that act as mini sundials. Under these lighting conditions, only indented footprints could create the pattern of shadows we see. So the footprints must be indentations after all. So the problem is that our brains have a bias toward top-down illumination, which means that the brain tends to assume light is coming from above. Now this bias is so strong that it often competes and overcomes the clues our vision is giving us about relative depths. So when light comes from a slightly different angle, in the case of the footprints in low sun, our brain tries to tell us they're convex instead of concave. And you can find some great photos illustrating this illusion at thenakedscientist.com forward slash forum sent in by our listeners. And from a few rounded shapes now to millions of the things, bubbles. I sometimes like a nice warm bath in the winter. After a while, the bath gets colder. I know there are a few ways that the bath can lose heat, but does a thick layer of bubbles on the top make any significant difference to the heat retention? And that question was from Stephen Tyndall. So can a layer of bath bubbles keep the water warmer for longer? Answers to chris at thenakedscientist.com. You can Twitter at Naked Scientists. You can find us on Facebook or right on our forum, and that's at thenakedscientist.com forward slash forum. Diana O'Carroll. In fact, that illusion she described is also manifest as what's called the hollow mask illusion, and it's very striking if you want to look it up on YouTube. That's it for this week. Thank you to our guest, David Julius, from UCSF, and to our production team, Tom Simpkins, Ben Vausler, and Emma Stoy. Thank you very much, and thank you for sending in your science questions. Next week, we're doing chemistry by design. We'll find out how computer-aided design can help us to develop new medicines, catalysts, and chemicals in what's causing quite a reaction in the world of chemistry. Have a great week, and see you next time. The Naked Scientists comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC, the Natural Environment Research Council and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at thenakedscientists.com. 